Well, thanks a lot for that very, very nice uh, introduction. And thanks so much, everybody, for coming. I'm going to be talking about uh, income inequality in Catholic social thought. And, and as you probably know, I mean, income inequality in the United States today and elsewhere is one of the defining issues of our time. Um, I'm going to be talking about basically three different issues here. Uh, the first, I just want to give some basic background information on Catholic social thought and economic justice to set the stage for the discussion of inequality in Catholic social thought. Uh, I'm then going to talk about a fair bit about contemporary inequality in here, but I'm going to do two things. I'm going to both describe the kinds of inequality and the trends we've been seeing in the United States, as well as uh, the possible sources of that change in inequality that we've been seeing. And then finally, I'll end up bringing these two things together and evaluating the kinds of inequality that we're seeing, the changes that we've seen in light of Catholic social thought and the Catholic social thought principles. So let me just start briefly here with <coughs> Catholic social thought and economic justice. And a couple of points. First, the ideas of economic justice have been a topic of Catholic social thought for over 100 years. You know, it started, the, the, the current tradition started in the late 1800s with Rerum Novarum and moved forward ever since through a series of documents, uh, encyclicals, pastoral letters, so on and so forth. And in each stage, what the tradition here, you go, yeah, you're a professor, you deserve a chair. <laughs> At each stage, it's addressed uh, what are called the signs of the times, the important social concerns facing society at the time. So we've heard about uh, comments on the Great Depression, uh, globalization, the fall of communism, and what that's meant for market economies. And up until today, uh, where we're hearing now about inequality, I don't have more to say about that. A second point is that in this tradition, there is no preferred economic paradigm. That is to say, <clears throat> the tradition has been as critical of capitalism as it has been of socialism. It holds neither right, in any great stead. Rather, it's focused more on the sense of justice that any economic system can provide. Having said that, there is somewhat of a preference in this tradition for market-based economies that are regulated, sometimes in important ways, so that both the processes and outcomes are consistent with the basic principles of capital social thought. And the last point I want to make is that while the system is, while the, the tradition is concerned with justice in general and the common good, there's a special emphasis on concerns about poverty and the poor. And that plays out in one of the important aspects of the tradition, known as the preferential option for the poor, wherein the poor are seen as having a primary claim on a society's resources. Right? Not the sole claim, but the pr a primary claim. We must think about the poor above other people, although we think of everybody. Now, in particular, what does the tradition say about income inequality? Well, the first thing to note is that the tradition recognizes that some degree of inequality is useful. That is, we're not going to push for equal incomes across everybody. The idea is that some income inequality is useful and necessary to provide incentives and rewards for different kinds of jobs to uh, give incentives for innovation, for productivity, and for general well-being. Having said that, it doesn't accept any level of inequality that a market will generate. Unlike, say, a traditional view of economics, view of classical economics, where we assume that the market knows best, that whatever uh, prices and wages are generated are optimal. No, the tradition says no. In fact, <coughs> 
we have to scrutinize any degree of uh, income inequality in light of the various principles of Catholic social thought. But first and foremost, the overriding principle is that the economy is for the person, not the person for the economy. That's based in the, in, in the fundamental idea of the dignity of the person. Above all, it is the dignity of the person that must be respected, and that we can evaluate inequality in light of that idea. Does it satisfy that idea? So we can ask questions like, does the current the extent of inequality support the common good? That is, does it give ready access to all individuals to their authentic development, both through public and private goods? Right? Or is inequality not supporting that? We can ask, is the dignity of work and the rights of workers respected? And here what we're talking about specifically is the right to a just wage, the right to unionize, right? the right to various kinds of economic goods, such as a secure retirement, health care, decent housing. Right? This is how we're going to evaluate the degree of income inequality. Thirdly, is the system detrimental to the development of social solidarity? This is an important principle, the idea of that people are inher inherently social beings and that we can only achieve authentic development in the community with others. And so what's important is, is the degree of inequality so much that the fabric of society is being ripped apart and that community between people that's necessary cannot be formed? So we're going to have to evaluate the degree of inequality in light of that principle as well. And then, does inequality inhibit full participation? The idea here is this principle of participation that everyone has both a responsibility and a right to participate in society. You have a, to the extent you can, you are obligated to contribute to the common good. However, with that responsibility comes the right. If you want to participate and can, you must be able to. And the idea is, is the degree of inequality such that people are inhibited from participating in social life, in economic life, and in political life? Right? So we have to evaluate the degree of inequality in light of that as well. Given that, in the tradition, there is both an explicit and strong presumption against extreme inequality, and I'll talk about that a little later towards the end. Okay? So, some inequality can be accepted, but up to a point. After that, then something has to be done to change the situation. Okay. Turning to contemporary inequality. Well, as many of you may know, or perhaps you don't, income inequality has grown markedly over the last 25, 30 years. And I'm going I'm to get very specific about what that means and what that looks like. But it's grown markedly, and the question is, what are we to think about? And typically, when we think in terms of you know, applying this idea of Catholic social thought to some kind of moral evaluation, we, provide, we kind of proceed in three steps. First, there's a descriptive aspect. That is, what does inequality look like? What, has, what is the extent that it's actually increased? Secondly, there's an analytical component, meaning that we need not only to describe, but we need to explain what are the possible sources of this rise, because depending on what that source is, that'll have different implications for the moral evaluation. And then finally, we have this evaluation in light of the principles. And so the typical way this is phrased is, what we're doing is we're trying to put faith in dialogue with reason. That is to say, we don't talk about abstract principles of Catholic social thought, but rather their application has to be done in a way that accounts for science, in this case social science, and the actual facts on the ground. What does inequality look like? What do the theories say? What are the sources? Then we put the then we do the evaluation after that. Okay, so let's given that, let me start with some description. What does inequality in the United States look like? <clears throat> Here's a chart that shows the distribution of income kind of in rough terms in 2009, and there's both the income, the distribution of income and the distribution of wealth. So in this column here, it's the distribution of income, and, and you know, let me state the obvious, if we had an equal distribution of income, the top 1% would have 1% of the income, 
the next 9% would have 9%, the bottom 90 would have 90% of the income. As you can see, things are quite different than that. Right now, or relatively, in the relative recent period, the top 1% has about a little over 20, 21% of all the income in the country. The next 9% have about 26%. So together, the top 10% has about 47% of the income. The bottom 90% has the remaining 53%. The income, and that's, so that's some fair degree of inequality, right? And it's clearly income is clearly skewed toward the top. The distribution of wealth is even more skewed. Here's two columns, net worth and net financial assets. So net worth has all people's holdings, all their assets, both the property that they own, like their houses, as well as the financial wealth that they own, cash, bank accounts, stocks and bonds, and so forth. And you can see if you look at net worth or the total holdings, the top 10% have 75% of all the wealth in the country. If you look at just financial assets, stocks and bonds, it's even more concentrated. The top 10% has 83% of all the financial wealth in the country. That's extreme concentration of wealth. That's extreme concentration of wealth. So today, we have a lot of income inequality. Again, the question really will have to evaluate that, but in fact, there's a lot of income inequality. Okay. The next graph I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you over the next 10 minutes is of some different pictures. I know looking at numbers is not sometimes the favorite pastime of people, but it is necessary to get a, a solid feel for what's going on. Okay, this graph shows, the other one showed where we are today. This shows how inequality has changed over time between 1979 and 2007. So what I have here is the average real after-tax income, where real means adjusted for inflation, growth in income by what's called the income quintile, so the 20%, each 20% of the income distribution. So here's the growth in the average income in the lowest 20%, the next 20%, the middle, the fourth, and then here what I've done is I've broken the top 20% into two pieces, the 81st to the 99th percentile, and then I've taken out the top 1% to show you what's happening there. And as you can see what's happening, there's been growth in each of the quintiles of income, but they've been uneven. And in fact, the higher up you go in the income distribution, the greater the growth has been. What that means is, in simple terms, is we've seen growing inequality. The bottom has grown a bit. The next 20 has grown even more, so the second 20 is pulling away from the bottom 20. The middle 20 has grown even more. That's pulling away from everybody else. The next is pulling away. So every, we're seeing this pulling out of the income distribution. Income is becoming more unequal. But the, uh, the second important thing to notice that's kind of obvious is that while there's been a spreading out in the income distribution down here, most of the action is at the very top. That is, it's the top 1% that's really pulled away from everybody else. Their income has grown by 275% over the period. Whereas, for example, the average income in the lowest 20% has only grown by 25%. So the key to understanding, in other words, the growth in income inequality over the last 25, 30 years is understanding what's happening at the very top of the income distribution. That's what we need to know. And in terms of our evaluation, that's really what we're going to have to evaluate. It's true, there's been some growth in inequality down here, but the, all the cookies are at the top. The next graph kind of puts that growth in the top in, in historical perspective. So here's the growth from 79. This is the top 1%. This is the growth in the share of income held by the top 1% from 1979 to the present. And you can see it's grown from the top 1% having about 8% of all income to about 20% of all income. That's dramatic growth. But if you look at historical perspective, it's even more striking because we haven't seen this much income held by the top 1% in over 90 years. The last time we saw that was during the Roaring Twenties, just before the whole economy imploded. Between that period, what we saw was a dramatic decline. That is, we saw a dramatic decrease in income inequality. 
during this period before it grows. And I also want to point out that this period when the share of income held by that top percent was shrinking, this period here was the strongest economic growth we've seen in the last 100 years. So the claim that's sometimes made that we need this degree of income inequality in order to have a healthy functioning market economy is simply not true. We've seen actually much less inequality with much stronger economic growth. The next thing, I'm now going to go even deeper, I'm going deeper and deeper into what's going on in that top 1%, because this is also a clue to what's going on. What I've got here is I've graphed not only the growth in the share of income going to the top 1%, but the share that's going to the top 0.5%. So now we're getting even richer. And then the top 1.1%, even richer. And then the top 0.01%. So these are the ultra, super, you know, incredibly rich people. And what you want to notice is two things. Number one, the share going of income going to each of these richer and richer and richer groups has been rising. That's obvious because each of the lines are sloping up. So over time, more and more of the income has been going to these upper and upper echelons. But there's another thing I want you to notice that's actually not so obvious just looking at the graph. And that is, while all the lines are going up, so they're all growing, the higher up in the income distribution you go, the greater the percentage increase is. So the movement from here to here, the income share of the very of the top 1% has doubled, down by a factor of two. The income share held by the top 0.5% has increased by 2.5, a factor of 2.5. The share going to the top 0.1% has increased by a factor of four. The share going to the top 0.01% has increased by a factor of 6.6. .6. So what's happening, it's kind of interesting. The higher and higher you go, the more the dramatic the gains. So not only is income flowing increasingly to the top echelons, it's flowing to the tippy top echelons. So the, one of the questions we're going to ask is, in this puzzle, what could possibly have happened over the past 30 years that caused this such a dramatic change. Because we have the rich pulling away from everybody else, the very rich pulling away from the rich, and the super ultra, you know, super duper rich pulling away from the very rich. This next graph shows an international comparison because another interesting thing about what's happening in inequality in the United States is it's not necessarily been seen in other parts of the world. This is the growth in the top 0.1% share across different countries. And you can see, and these are all industrialized countries, so they're comparable. There's a bunch of countries who saw growth in that top share, but it's a relatively small amount of growth. Then there's a couple of countries that have seen more intermediate growth, and then there's the United States, which is the outlier, right? So what this is telling us, at least it's telling me, is that there's not some one simple reason why we've seen this great increase of the top incomes going to the top people, but rather there's something particular about the policies and institutions in different countries that are giving rise to very different experiences of the last 30 years. Right? And then the final one on the income distribution, this is just the level of income inequality across uh, different countries. So again, in, in international comparison, I just want to show, so after all that growth in income inequality across different countries, this is where we're left. And what we see is not only is the degree of inequality in the United States very, very high in his, its own historic comparison, it's also the highest in the world among advanced industrialized countries we have the, high, the greatest amount of income inequality. This is something called the Gini index. It's just an index of inequality. The higher it is, the more inequality in the country. And you can see that we have the highest in the world, in the industrialized world. One last point I want to make just in terms of the data. 
has to do with income mobility. That is, the ability to start in a particular place in the income distribution, but over time, end up somewhere else. And the reason this is important to think about is because some people have argued, well, OK, fine. We have greater income inequality. But that's not so important if everybody in society is increasingly able to get to that top, the top reaches. That is, if you can grab the brass ring, who cares if the brass ring is further away from everybody else? As long as the game is fair and everybody's got a shot. This is a study done by an economist whose name is Miles Korak. It was done in 2006. And what, what he did was he got data that enabled him to follow people over time. It's called longitudinal data. You can follow individuals over time and see how their income changes over time. And what he did was he created an index of, of, of mobility, which is based on how the kids' income compare to their parents when both are the same age. So for example, they'd ask, how much did the father earn when the father was 35 years old? Then they follow the kids and say, how much did the kids earn when they were 35 years old? And the extent to which they differ, either they earn greater amounts or less amounts, that gives you an indication of how mobile people are. Mobility is both rising income and falling income. The closer the kid's income is to the parents, the less mobility. That's kind of the general idea. Well, if you compare across all countries, what you find out is that not only does the United States have the highest level of inequality, it also has almost the lowest level of mobility across. And so the numbers here, the, the United States is given a value of one. And all the other countries are relevant or, or evaluated relative to it. So the numbers themselves don't mean anything particularly interesting, but they mean something in a relative sense. So for example, Jer uh, Denmark has a value a little over three. What that means is the income mobility in Denmark is over three times what it is in the United States. And you can see we're way down towards the bottom. And the last thing I would, I would mention is just a very important <coughs> study that was published by a group of researchers headed by someone at Harvard, an economist named Raj Chetty at Harvard, that looked at the change in mobility over time. And basically, in the United States, mobility has been stagnant over the last 30 years or so. So at the same time that we've seen income inequality rise dramatically, especially at the most upper echelons, income mobility has not offset that. It's stagnated and left us with not only extraordinarily high inequality, but extraordinarily low mobility. So that's kind of the factual context that we need to think about as we move forward. And now I'm going to talk a bit about possible sources of those changes and then the evaluation of those changes. OK, what are the reasons for growing income inequality? You know, th this, is a, this is a complex issue, and there's an extensive literature, academic literature on this. But basically, there's two sets of explanations where we can group the various particulars in, two kind of categories of explanations. And the first one is based on and appeals to the natural workings of the labor market in the United States, a free working labor market. And in particular, the main one here is relies on an idea of skill biased technological change. Now, the natural work is the labor market. Yeah, the basic idea here is you have a supply of labor and a demand for labor. And the interaction produces wages and income. The idea of skill biased technological changes that during this period, we've seen various important technological changes, in particular you know, computerization, uh, advances in telecommunications, things like that. And the argument is that those changes have been biased toward people with more skills and education, skill biased technological change. And as a result, <coughs> Those people with more skills have become much more productive and therefore much more in demand in the labor market. As a result, 
the demand for those high, more highly educated people has risen, and therefore their wage has gone up. Because they're in such great demand, they have better bargaining power, they can demand higher wages. And therefore, their wages have risen relative to other people, pulling apart the income distribution. Right? That's the argument. And it's a very straightforward argument, and it appeals, again, to the natural wages. And the other thing is, it appeals to something completely neutral, technological change. It's like the weather. It just happens. You, you might get mad, but you can't really do anything about it. We just have to accept it and adapt. You get an umbrella. That's all you can do. Same thing here. The idea is, if it's technological change, all you can do is get more skills. That's the thing. Now, however intuitive that sounds, this has been subject to some important critiques that have drawn the importance of this into question. And I'll just give you a couple of them. Number one, to the extent it's technological change, all countries can avail themselves, all industrialized advanced countries can avail themselves of that technology. Right? But what we just saw, if that's true, we should see the same kind of inequality increase in all the countries. But as we just saw in that graph, all different countries had very different experiences. Some hardly any increase in inequality at all. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, in the United States, 30 to 35% of the population have a college degree. Yet, if this is true, we should see the wages of all of those people rise, and we should see 30 to 35% of the population pulling away from everybody else. But what did we see? We saw the top 1% pull away. How can that be? Thirdly, to the extent that it was technological change, the people who are most intimately involved in technology should have seen the biggest increases. Engineers, computer people, but we didn't. Who are the people that saw their wages rise the most? Who makes up the greatest fraction of the top 1% of the top 0.1%? CEOs, executives, lawyers. They're the ones who are the top. So it wasn't them. Thirdly, we should have seen, if this is true, we should have seen the wages of college <coughs> graduates increasingly rise. However, what the data show is, over the last 30 years, unfortunately for you all, the wages of new college graduates, on average, have basically stayed flat in real terms after adjusting for inflation. We haven't seen them spike up. They stayed relatively flat. And then two more points. Um, number one, technology doesn't necessarily make things more complicated and only available to skill people with lots of skill. They can actually dumb jobs down and make jobs more accessible to a lot of people. You know, it's much easier, for example, to work at McDonald's right now. Why? Because you look at the cash registers, you don't even have to know how to make change. All you have to do is press a button that has a picture of a Big Mac on it. And by, by the way, when did you all first pick up a computer? How old were you? I mean, my son was five years old. So there's that problem, right? And then finally, remember, we're not just trying to explain inequality. We're trying to explain a dramatic rise in inequality. And therefore, it's not enough that there's technological change, because there's always been technological change. The, you know, the invention of air flight, the railroad, transistors, penicillin. To, to explain a dramatic rise, we need a dramatic acceleration in technological change. And no one has been able to argue or point to that. In fact, some very reputable economists, uh, one Robert Gordon at Northwestern has actually argued we've actually seen a slowdown in technolo technological change over time. OK, if it's not that, then what is it? Yeah, one more thing before I move on. I don't want to say that this has nothing to do with it. But the point is that to the extent that we've seen this dramatic rise, this is probably going to have a very, very small role. So what could it be then? Well, that's the second set of explanations. And they appeal not so much to economics per se, but rather to political economy. And this is sometimes called the power shift. And the idea here is that far from the natural workings of the economy and the natural evolution of technological change, what's happened 
is that we've seen inequality as, not as a natural phenomenon, but a growth in inequality as an accomplishment. That is to say, we've seen explicit changes in the rules of the game. We've seen explicit changes in the way markets are structured, right? And those changes have been done purposefully and have skewed resource flows away from one group and toward another. In particular, the argument is that business has used its political power and its bureaucratic power to change the rules of the game and skew income flows away from labor and toward CEOs and the owners of the corporation. And it's done in a variety of ways. But before I go through that, just let me mention what the context is. Remember, the great rise in inequality that we saw started in the mid to late 1970s. Why then? Well, here's the argument. Up until the early, mid 1970s, the United States had predominant economic power in the world. Corporations were very powerful, and the gains that profitability was shared both with the owners of the corporations as, and with labor, right? Workers were doing well. You saw inequality was actually falling. But corporations were also doing well. At that time, in the early to mid-1970s, a number of factors came together which started to greatly decrease the profitability of business. What were those things? One of them was the OPEC oil price increases. Secondly, unions became increasingly militant. They felt powerful and became increasingly militant. We started to see a sharp spike in the number of strikes, the demands for higher wages, cost of living adjustments. That was reducing profitability. The higher energy prices were reducing profitability. We had a very progressive tax system, which was taking money away from the corporations, in their view, uh, for the government. We had increasingly uh, more and more regulations of business, both in the form of increased uh, Workplace regulations, OSHA, was formed. We had increasing environmental regulations. Right? All of those things resulted in business profitability falling and falling. The idea was that business got together. And by the way, this is documented very well. If you want to look at the actual particulars of how this was done, there's a great book called Winner Take All Politics by Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson. Uh, Pearson's at Berkeley and, and Hacker, they're both political scientists, Hacker's at Yale. But the idea was that business got together and helped form a movement that pushed for changes both within their own firms as well as at the government level. And they did a variety of things. In addition, they devoted a lot of money to an ideological offensive whereby they wanted to push the idea that free markets best left alone or the best way of achieving prosperity. So for example, we saw a lot of money donated and given to the foundation and creation of things like the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, a reanimation of the American Enterprise Institute. We saw the foundation of the Business Roundtable, which is a group of top executives in the country that strategize and make legislative recommendations to Congress. We saw the advent of mass mailings by Richard Vigory, who is an operative in the uh, Republican Party, to raise money. And we saw a great increase in the amount of lobbying. All this aimed at changing the laws and the ways business operate to reestablish profitability. And so what, did, what were some of the outcomes of that movement, of that offensive? Well, we saw the increasing outsourcing, the movement of production to low-wage countries, accommodated by free trade agreements that were written in part by these business, business itself, the business lobbyists, business roundtable, and so forth. We saw a great push toward de-unionization and anti-labor initiatives, a uh, movement to what were so-called right-to-work states, where union representation was much, much, much harder to get anti-labor initiatives, such as changes in the rules at the level of government over who would be eligible for overtime pay, uh, court challenges where businesses were suing to get 
to go into bankruptcy and shed pension responsibilities that they had to their workers. And all these things were being accommodated. Um, we saw tax cuts that were greatly skewed toward the more wealthy individuals during the Reagan years and the Bush years especially, right? That benefited people at the very, very top. We saw big cuts in the period in the social safety net. We saw, of course, welfare reform was the best known one. Dramatic cuts in both the amount of welfare and the availability of welfare. In addition, we saw work requirements which were increasingly forcing women to take low-wage jobs, which once again helps us reestablish profitability. We saw cuts in unemployment insurance. We saw dramatic cuts in food stamps. We saw dramatic cuts in housing assistance in the period. We saw dramatic cuts in money that was meant to help cities and in inner cities. Uh, we saw stagnation in the minimum wage. And in case you don't know, the way minimum wages work is the federal minimum wage is not automatically indexed to anything. In order to increase the minimum wage, you have to actually enact legislation each time to do it. So what the politicians were doing in Congress was, rather than actually cut minimum wages, they simply refused to increase it, and they let inflation, which was ongoing at the time, erode the real or purchasing power value of it over time. Right? Uh, there were changes in corporate hiring practices. There was a big shift in the period using the bureaucratic power of businesses to increasingly use contingent labor, part-time labor, right? day labor. What, what did that do? Well, the way it works in the United States, contingent labor earned proportionately less than a full-time labor. So in other words, if you're a full-time laborer, you might earn you know, $200 a week. If you're only a part-time worker, laborer working half time, you're not going to earn $100, half of that. You're going to earn proportionally less, maybe $60. So by shifting, you can proportionally decrease your payroll costs, right? Uh, the advantage of, of contingent labor also is they get no benefits. So you, you shed the benefits. And thirdly, it's virtually impossible for contingent labor to unionize because to unionize, you need a group of people who are together to achieve solidarity. By having people coming and going, it's hard to get these people to agree to a union. So you're saving money on benefits, you're saving money on wages, and you're preventing unionization, which tends to raise wages. All of those things are helping establish profitability. There were changes in CEO compensation procedures. There, this included both the way in which <coughs> CEO wages were set, as well as norms. I'm going to show you a picture of this the norms by which these, these wages were set. So for example, we saw the increasing use of stock options, which gave CEOs lots and lots of more money, um, among other things. And then finally, we saw changes in laws related to financial markets. In particular, we saw the great deregulation of financial markets. And what did that do? It allowed a couple of things. Number one, it allowed financial market firms, investment banks, large commercial banks, it allowed them to use what's called a lot more leverage. That is to say, they could invest using more and more borrowed money. And without going into the details, what that does is it allows you to earn much more profit on a given amount of investment. Um, the second thing it did was it created all kinds of new layers in financial services, and each of these layers allowed these firms to earn more and more service fees. So together, it allowed a much greater rate of profit. So all of these things were all aimed at one thing and one thing only, to transfer or shift power from labor to capital in an effort to consciously increase the rate of profitability in light of the challenges they were facing in the mid to early 1970s. And just let me show you a couple of pictures to illustrate this point. One way this played out, for example, is the increasing divergence between workers' productivity and the wages that they were paid. Usually, if a competitive, if you really do have a competitive labor market, as workers' productivity increases, they should be worth more and the firm 
should be able to pay them more. In fact, according to the logic of the competitive markets, they would have to. If not, this, this worker would say, well, if you're not going to pay me since I'm worth it, I'll go somewhere else. You pay me this whether you like it or not. And the firm would have to do the competition or they would lose the worker to another firm. And that was true for a long time, except right up into the mid-1970s. What happened then? Well, before productivity and wages or compensation, which includes benefits, they were moving together. All of a sudden, they started to split apart. Productivity kept rising. That is, workers were more and more efficient in producing more and more stuff per hour. But it wasn't being reflected in their wages. Why not? Because of all those things I just mentioned. The lack of unions to enforce it, right? The stagnating minimum wage, right? All of those things allowed business to increasingly take the productivity and keep it to themselves. That's the growing inequality. All that productivity means earned income is being created and earned. But the fact that wages aren't keeping up means that the income was not going to the workers whose productivity was rising. It was going elsewhere. That's the growth in the public. That's the growth in the inequality. In fact, here's what happened to CEO compensation in the period. This is the ratio of CEO pay to average worker pay. And after staying at around 25 or 30 for a long period of time, relatively flat, around 1979, we start to see this uptrend. And then toward the mid to late 1980s, we see it skyrocket. That was the change in the compensation procedures and in the norms of compensation. And it skyrocketed. And right now, these ups and downs, these have to do with the stock market crashes because part of the compensation of CEOs is in the form of stock options. So as the stock price crashed, so to some extent did their compensation, but it comes back. It's coming back again. But even with those ups and downs, it's now at about 275. That means that the average CEO earns 275 times what the average worker does, whereas before it was 30. Another way to think about that is, on average, there's about 280 work days per year. That means that a CEO makes in one day what the average worker takes an entire year. So you can see where that additional productivity was going. It was going there. Now, just a couple more pictures. This shows the importance of unions. What I've done here is I've shown the percent of the workforce which is unionized, which is the blue line, and the share of income going to the top, I think it was 10% on the program. Yeah, top 10%. And you can see these, di these graphs, they're not exact mirror images, but they're pretty close. That is to say, the stronger the union gets, the lower the share of income going to the top 10. They level out, this goes down, that goes up. And you'll notice what happened. We peak right about here, and, it, and the percent of the union, the, of the workforce that's unionized falls a bit here. And that had to do with the change in legislation. An important piece of legislation called the Taft-Hartley Law, which made it more difficult to unionize, and so it fell. But then it started to, at that lower level, it started to flatten out. But come the early to mid-1970s, down, and it accelerated here. Now, actually, this stops in 2008, if I was to keep going. Despite all the talk about unions, the percent of the private sector workforce that you, that's unionized is only about 6%. Only about 6%. Now, the percent of the public workforce which is unionized is greater, but the private is only about 6%. But the point is, as unionization was fought and fought successfully, that contributed. In fact, some studies suggest that about 25% of the increase in inequality we've seen can be attributed to that decrease in unionization. And what do unions do? Unions give workers higher wages than they otherwise would get. On average, about 25% compared to similar non-unionized workers. We also help decrease income inequality because they tend to raise the wages of lower wage workers more than the upper, so they squash it that way. And they also tend to equalize wages for a position across firms. So they would ensure, for example, that a cashier at Acme 
would earn the same as a cashier at Whole Foods or something like that. But as we diminish the role of unions, inequality is allowed to rise. Um, the last picture I'm going to show you has to do with what happened with the tax, the taxes and social safety net. This is a study done by the Congressional Budget Office. And what it shows is the degree to which federal transfers or so social safety net and federal taxes, the extent to which it reduces income inequality. So the way you want to read this graph is, this is the percent reduction in inequality due to transfers and taxes. So back in 1980, taxes and transfers at the federal level were reducing inequality by about 24%. Without those, it would have been 24% higher. But look what's happened over time. The extent of the reduction due to taxes and transfers has decreased from about 24% down to about 16, 16 and a half percent or so. So there's been about the reduction by about one third. So instead of reducing inequality by 24%, we're only reducing it by about 16% now. And you can see the probably the biggest part was the cuts in the social safety net. And you can see there's a, the dramatic decreases due to the cutbacks in funding for all those things I said, for all those programs I mentioned. And to some extent, taxes. We saw a big decrease in progressivity under the Reagan tax cuts. There were reestablished progressivity under Clinton, and then it came down a bit more under Bush. So all of those reasons, the political economy reasons, right? what the firms were doing themselves inside, how they helped structure policy, whether it's free trade agreements, anti-labor legislation, taxes, transfers, minimum wages, those are the things that help explain this shift in income from most of the income distribution to the very, very upper reaches. OK, now, the last part. What are we to think about this? What is Catholic social thought to say about the level of income inequality we have now? Well, very recently, there was a document put out by, the, the, uh, by, by Pope Francis. Right? It was his first major document. And in it, he has comments on the economy. And I'm going to, before I talk about a more kind of systematic way of thinking about it, I'm just going to give you three quotes to give a sense of where he stands on this. These are all from the, the document Evangelii Gaudium. While the earnings of a minority are growing exponentially, so too is the gap separating the majority from the prosperity enjoyed by those happy few. This imbalance is the result of ideologies which defend the absolute autonomy of the marketplace and financial speculation. A new tyranny is thus born, which unilaterally and relentlessly imposes its own laws and rules. Think about what he's saying relative to what I just said. Secondly, we have to say, quote, thou shalt not to an economy of exclusion and inequality. Such an economy kills. Today, everything comes under the laws of competition and survival of the fittest, where the powerful feed upon the powerless. As a consequence, masses of people find themselves excluded and marginalized without work, without possibilities, without any means of escape. And thirdly, some people continue to defend trickle-down theories, which assume that economic growth encouraged by a free market will inevitably succeed in bringing about greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by facts, expresses a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power and in the sacralized workings of the prevailing economic system. Note the repeated references to power, right? the power relationships, to conscious efforts to shift resources, right? He's got it exactly right, exactly right. What then, in summary, might we think about this? Well, one thing we can do is we can go back a little in time 
1986 from a document called Economic Justice for All. This was a pastoral letter by the Catholic bishops on the US economy. It was written in 1986. And this is what they said about income inequality at the time. We find the disparities of income and wealth in the United States to be unacceptable. Now, I want to emphasize that this is 1986, because in 1986, 43 or 44 percent of all income was held by the top 20 percent of people in the United States, the top 20 percent, and it was unacceptable. Today, you remember that first graph I showed you, the top 10 percent have 45 percent. So if they didn't like income inequality then, they sure as heck don't like it now. Why? Well, it, becomes, it runs counter to a number of those things I was talking about. Number one, they explicitly note, and this is within the new document, Evangelii Gaudi, you can see it. It runs counter to social solidarity. It's ripping society apart. There's no more sense of community, right? He said it explicitly. And that's going to interfere with the social nature of the person, their ability to authentically develop in community with others, right? Second, it violates the dignity and the rights of the workers. Catholic social thought has emphatically and consistently defended the rights of workers to unionize. Not only that, it's encouraged workers to unionize, in part because it's functioned as it's called as a sword of economic justice, that is, it's getting fairer wages, but also because it promotes social solidarity. That has been violated. The rights of workers have been violated. Why? Minimum wages are too low. The persistence of poverty in the face of increasing amounts of wealth at the top. Right? This is what Catholic social thought is looking at and is saying it doesn't like. Right? The taking away of pension rights. That's what it doesn't like, of workers. These are things that are due workers as a matter of justice, not as a matter of some Right, uh, neutral working of a marketplace is if there is such a thing. Thirdly, it violates the principle of participation, the ability of people to participate fully in economic, social, and political life. Right? You know, for example, look at what growing income inequality has done to the political system, the role of money, especially after the Citizens United decision. It also is points to things like the decreased spending on public goods that allow even people of more modest means for enjoying things like parks, public parks, good schools, good libraries. Increasingly, things are privatized, right? People at the top don't need to care about that because they can buy their own stuff. You can buy your own books. You don't need a library, right? You don't need a park because you can go on your own vacation, right? You don't need a good police force. Why? Because you can have your own private security, right? All of those things limit the ability of people to authentically develop and participate fully in the life of the community. That's what it's criticizing here. And finally, it's violating the preferential option for the poor. Look at what's happening in Congress. What did we just do? We, we refused to ex expand unemployment insurance, despite all of the people who are still employed. We've cut food stamps in the midst of a recession. Right? We're talking about cutting Social Security. Right? This in the presence of increasing and unbelievable amounts of wealth at the top. Right? This violates the option for the poor and hence statements such as those we heard from Pope Francis. A new tyranny is right. Inequality that kills, an economy that kills. Right? And this is not just figuring that he's talking. What, is, what does this mean? Because this is a structural issue, because of the reasons we were talking about. This is structural, this is purposeful, this is intentional. This is another quote from Economics Just Fraud, and again, this was back in 1986. What do we have to do? Because it's structural, we need structural remedies as a matter of justice. Justice requires, they say, that all members of society work for economic, political, and social reforms that will decrease the inequity. 
This is justice that demands action, and it demands action in concrete ways. And it's structurally free. And I'm just going to leave with one last thing. And the key thing about Catholic social thought is it gives scope to the market, like I said. But it also gives important scope to the government as something that can help build communities. And this is basically what it's calling for. So let me just leave it there, and uh, I'll be happy to discuss and take questions.